Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford, author, writer, podcaster now, and generally outdoor adventurer. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a kinesiologist from Ontario, Canada, and Molly's co-host uh, on the podcast, and I guess in life, you're, you're my co-host. Aw, thanks. Actually, I was just going to say, and also husband, because as we found out um, from our last interview, a lot of people don't actually realize that, <laughs> which yeah. sort of seems funny to me, but anyway. Well, it's all for the hype. Yeah. It's better, better Instagram follows and likes. Yeah, yeah. Which is for me, actually, for me, I mean, for you, yeah. We just yeah. fake all of our fights on here. I'm not really arguing with you. That doesn't happen. So, someone ever. was like, "Oh yeah, here we did like a cyclocross practice here in town the other night, uh, just sort of impromptu, and it was really fun." Um, and the guys actually did pretty well. There was a big cross race, and a few of the guys wanted to sort of hone up. They were coming. They hadn't done a lot of cyclocross. They were road cyclists, so we gave them sort of a, a bit of an introduction to cross stuff, and sort of diagnosed and practiced and played around. Uh, which is always fun, uh, but they were saying the one guy was saying that he really enjoyed the Allen Iverson. Uh, I'm forgetting the other guy's name that I was saying, but the the mix up LeBron, about the, LeBron James, LeBron Iverson, uh, LeBron and uh, Allen Iverson mix up. Was so. he really impressed that I knew that one? Yeah, yeah. I don't think anyone doubted your <laughs> your 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 meme knowledge. Hey, you're the one that brought that one to my attention, so that really feels like it's on you. Anyway, so it's actually really popular right now. Like I've had three other mentions. I think three. I don't think I'm exaggerating. In the last, let's say, month, that that practice thing has come up in like a couple books, a couple, I guess, podcasts or something. And someone just randomly brought it up. No, um, it comes I, up at dinner with the Aspire Racing crew. I'd say probably every other race. It's pretty funny. It's like someone quoting the meme. Yeah, yeah. I mean, granted, dinner with Aspire Racing. Apologies to any of them listening is basically like one giant meme, but... Right, right. You know, bike racers. We like the internet. Anyway, so you've been you've been up in Canada doing some cyclocross practice and gym stuff, and I have been down in the States for Charm City Cyclocross this past weekend, which was super, super fun. It's probably one of my favorite of the cyclocross races. I've been going to that one almost 10 years now, I realized. And it's just a perennial favorite because the people are just super cool. There's a lot of puppies around. The course is fun. I, it's one of the few races where I'm genuinely like devastated to not be out there racing. Uh, they built the most intense flyover. It was there was scaffolding. It was the most like Euro feature I've ever seen in a U.S. race. That's pretty. Yeah, I saw the scaffolding and I was like, it's happening. Yeah. yeah things, things are getting crazy. It was so intense. And it was, yeah, it was a super fun weekend. I got to uh, play a little consummate athlete with, uh, with the team mechanic, Tom. We went running on Saturday and then we did our weekly yoga. I'm pretty stoked. We've, for three race weekends now, every Sunday has been Ryan Leach yoga. And you can find out more about that at ryanleachconnection.com. Use... What is I don't think that's that. It's RyanLeach.com. RyanLeach.com. I'm sorry. And what is the code to get a month free? Uh, they'll have to go back into the show notes. I think it's Ryan and the number one. I think like, so. But it, you go back it's to the, our... the numeral one. Yeah. Not. But it's it's linked and and spelt out for you in the in the podcast show notes. That was a couple of weeks uh, ago. With but Ryan yeah, Leach. the guys have got the guys have gotten really hooked on the Ryan Leach, the Zen voice, and the you know the, he's a mountain biker, but it so it's cool, but it's yoga, and yeah, they've they've gotten into it. And the routines are all pretty short, and yeah, it's about forty yeah. minutes. And I'm actually in the middle of doing an article where I'm doing like more full yoga classes every day for a month to see what it does. And man, I'm like. Yeah, maybe 10 days in, and I feel super different already. And it's just adding it on top of my normal training. And, yeah, I feel stronger. I feel more flexible. I had a bunch of people this weekend tell me I'm looking really, like, toned. So, yeah, I'm pretty stoked on it. Well, that's good. No one's told me I've looked toned, so I guess you're doing something good. I mean, a lot of people were really impressed with the picture of you doing that snatch slash hammer time thing on my Instagram. 
it's yeah, I've also seen it compared. At. What was the other like internet uh, meme? Gangnam uh, Style. Yeah, Gangnam Style. That was pretty spot on. Yeah, yeah. it really was. So if any, if anyone hasn't seen it, uh, at Molly J Hereford on Instagram. I just like to preface that one too, because that was like a warm up one. So I mean, I was popping pretty hard, but it was like honestly, it was sixty five pounds. So I mean, it wasn't really that much. But thank you uh, for the, someone thank on there you. said like it was one hundred and thirty, and you just ruined it. Anyway, today's podcast is super rad. It's one we've had actually in the in the bank for a while. So if we talk about summer plans in it, uh, apologies. But I don't think we really get heavily into what we are up to for the summer. Anyway, the guest is one of my good friends from collegiate cycling and sort of the New York, New Jersey cycling scene. So she's, you know, she's known me since way back when we were you know, pretty goofy college kids racing, uh, Becca Sheps. And she's super rad. She actually was recently featured in Bicycling Magazine for her kombucha brewing company, Mortal Kombucha, best name ever. Uh, So when I realized that she was going to be in that, I was like, oh my gosh, we have to talk to her because I'm kombucha obsessed. I love it very, very much. We drink a ridiculous amount of it. Uh, So I really wanted to get into a little bit of uh, kombucha brewing stuff with her, but then also talk about bike racing because she's had a really interesting path into racing and she has some really good tips for beginner racers, people that are, you know, road race curious, people who just want to be able to get up climbs with, you know, their group ride and are maybe struggling with that. So we go into that. We talk about small business. We talk about balancing being an entrepreneur and running a company with you know staying fit and you know she doesn't race quite as much as she used to but she's still out there you know riding a ton and yeah really having a good time out in Colorado now so So I'm sure I'm sure you guys cover this but for the listener deciding if they want to continue past our entertaining intro uh what is kombucha the best thing in the world. So kombucha is fermented tea. So basically you take tea, uh, you have this thing called a SCOBY, which is a, I'm going to mess it up, small colony organic bacteria or something. There's yeast in there too, I think maybe. Yeah. So it's basically this living thing. It's pretty weird looking. You put it in tea and then add sugar and it, the SCOBY basically eats the sugar, ferments the tea. And what you get is this lightly carbonated, really delicious, actually pretty low cal, uh, live drink. So it's basically like drinking a probiotic. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of fizzy and, you know, some people get sort of a beer taste out of it. There's a couple of different flavorings that you can do with it, obviously sort of like tea. There's all sorts of different varieties. Um, but we found it really good, um, sort of as an evening drink, if you're used to having juice or, you know, your cup of milk or, you know, alcohol, (laughs) uh, just to sort of, you know, you could do kombucha one day and then wine the next day. And that sort of, you know, half your intake pretty nicely there. And you can still spend your money in sort of this wasteful liquid way if you want. Uh, so, so it's, I think it makes a lot of sense from that perspective, but, uh, do you guys talk about how to brew it on your own? Yeah, we get into that a little bit and sort of the trials and tribulations. Of Cause it's, it's it not, it's, people might be like, oh, we're just dropping bacteria in and drinking this tea, but it's, it's like, it's like making yogurt or something, right? Like, or, uh, what's the thing of the, not spinach, but the, what am I? Sauerkraut. Uh, yeah. So people would know like sauerkraut. So it's similar, you know, it sounds really kooky, but we've been doing this for millennia or generations here. So. Yeah, Um, it's really tasty. I, yeah, I'm obsessed with it. I think it's the best thing. I would love to be able to brew more of it. We've had a couple, we had a couple good rounds, and then we had like a disaster one, so we need to get a new SCOBY if we're going to keep brewing it, which I think we will in the near future. Perfect. Well, this sounds like a good episode. I think we should let the people listen to it. I have several calls I need to do. It's busy times yeah, here with you're very athletes. Important. Well, athletes are starting seasons and getting, you know, ambitions for 2018. Not not the Emily Batty videos, but the uh, ambitions that people have towards activity and weight loss and mm-hmm. general consummate athlete lifestyles. So, all right. Um, well, let's let everyone get into this episode and get on with their their lives. Their, com- their, kombucha. their kombucha. Their kombucha filled lives. Awesome. All right. Consummate Athlete Podcast here with Becca Sheps, who is a creative director and bike racer turned kombucha brewer, which makes me very happy. Uh, She founded Mortal Kombucha, and now she's based in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, And I love that her one sentence was that she'll always be a 100% New Jersey girl at heart. So... (laughs) Let's let's start with New Jersey. I think you and I have known each other for almost a decade, which yeah. actually like freaks me out a little bit now that I'm 
<laughs> yeah, when you get the Facebook reminder. Yeah, I'm yeah. Uh, I'm like five weeks from thirty right now, so I'm I'm starting to get into like oh crap. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm thirty four, and I like a couple months from thirty five, which I just keep telling people I'm basically forty. So because it yeah. rounds when you hit thirty five. Yeah, like I mean, realistically, I'm like a seventy year old woman at heart, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely still like a slightly, slightly terrifying thing. But uh, yeah, I think I, yeah, like I think I lived in New York like 10 years ago now, almost. Oh my God. Yeah. And we met when we were both racing, I guess on the road at that point, right? Yeah. And some cyclocross. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk. How did you get into bike racing to begin with? And when was that? Oh God. Okay. So I rode as in a boat crew at the university of Wisconsin, lightweight crew. What? And, um, yeah, I, feel so, like I know so many cyclists that started with rowing. It's... Yeah. And you know, like I grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, mm-hmm. so it was there. And then, uh, yeah, UW has like the best lightweight crew program one or two to Princeton. So I rode there kind of cracked on early mornings, <laughs> quit the crew team, but then came back as like the novice assistant coach which really didn't, it just meant I didn't have to run at 5 a.m. I still had to like wake up. Mm -hmm. And then I quit altogether and was like, I'm going to be a college student at a party school. And (laughs) and then I realized like it was weird. I remember waking up one day and touching my quads and they didn't hurt and being like, oh my God, this is so weird. I'm not sore for like the first time in, you know, God knows how long. And um, I had a summer internship and the Tour de France was going on. And like, I think it was Lance Armstrong was like winning his fifth Tour de France. And I was like, <laughs> I could do that. Like, that looks cool. So I had like this old rock hopper that I think was my brother's. And it, it was like the derailleur now looking back was holding on by a single cable string. <laughs> and I was like, I'll just ride this everywhere. And I just rode it everywhere. And then I got back to school in the fall. And I went to a cycling team meeting. I was like one of two girls at the cycling club Mm -hmm. and uh we got like basically free treks it may have been like a really big discount because we were in wisconsin lance armstrong was like the coolest guy ever live strong bracelets were just coming out and trek is based out of waterloo and uh i was like yeah okay and i started riding bikes i had no idea what i was doing (laughs) i finished every race and would tell like my boyfriend at the time that i made some new friends and he was like that's not what you're supposed to do (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's exactly what you're supposed to do. Yeah, Whatever. Well, it seems to have worked out pretty well because I don't think I've ever really raced my bike. I think I've always just made friends in a bike race. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's where it started. And then, um, yeah, then I, like, moved to Atlanta, figured out mountain biking a little bit, moved to San Francisco, mountain biked more, Moved to New York City. Dan Chabanov was my neighbor, and we would run into each other. And he was like, "You should go to a bike race with me tomorrow." And I was like, "I don't really do road racing." And he's like, "Oh, it'll be really cool. Well, I'll meet you outside your house at 4 a.m. and we'll go to this Prospect Park race." And I don't know why I thought that was a good idea. Oh my god! And, so uh, this is hilarious, by the way, because <laughs> I remember being 18 and. I knew Dan Chabanov from like yeah. since I was 17 and him saying, hey, I've never raced before. Do you want to go to my first bike race? So- <laughs> That's super funny. Yeah. So Dan like met me outside my house at, I don't know, 4 or 5 a.m. And we rode in the dark to Prospect Park and I rode around in circles and I made some friends. And then um, <laughs> I had a car. So I'm pretty sure me and Dan's friendship and we're very good friends. But I think it started because he knew I had a car. And when you live in New York City, that's rare. So mm-hmm. if he could get me to bike race, we could go to more bike. He could go to more bike races. Yeah, it seems that seems about well, right for like I everyone I know a, from New York on, on his part. But uh, it worked out. We became good friends. And then I say that my like um, hobby got kind of out of control. Yeah, you got super serious. Hobby. I never got serious. The people around me got serious. I was still just making friends starting bike races. I don't even know the last time I finished a bike race. <laughs> so what that to say. Um, you know, it was just like, I think uh, I, I have type 1 diabetes. So then, like, I was having success, like, you know, in, like, local racing. Mm-hmm. And then team type 1 was like, oh, you should come race for us. And they kind of were just 
and now you're going to travel and now you're going to be doing the pro one, two races and you're going to be doing speed week. And I was like, Whoa, I don't think I should be doing this. And (laughs) then everyone's like, you're a professional. And I was like, I don't, I think that's a really insulting to actual professionals to say that, but, um, (laughs) it's fun. Like I'm a cat one somehow. That's funny. Um, and I'm not really racing this year, but I started LA sweat with Kelly Samuelson three years ago. So it's kind of fun just to be the, I'm the creative vision of that team. That's and, awesome. Or something. I love that. I think actually that's, that's pretty much how you and I like met each other and, you know, became friends, I guess, was in a road race. I feel like I remember this <laughs> happening now. Like just, there are two <laughs> types of bike racers, right? There's like the ultra serious, like head down, even when the pace isn't going crazy. And then there's the ones that are like, Hey, how's it going? Like, <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should have focused more energy on like the riding hard, but I'm nah. more, of a, more of a chatter. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, I'll say like the, you know, New Jersey and Northeast scene, maybe it's different now because I haven't raced road in forever. But when I was racing road, a lot of the races had a lot of kind of like that middle of the road downtime in the middle of them. Where you yeah, I mean, talk. like, if like living in Boulder, people don't want to coast as much. It's like... <laughs> You know, they just want to ride hard, but yeah. cool. you have to, you find the people that will coast. Yeah. <laughs> I realized that today I was out during a training ride and I was like, oh man, I haven't like actually pushed pedals consistently hard in I don't know how long. This is weird. Yeah. That's what, yeah yesterday I went out to ride and um, I, I said to my fiance, I was like, I don't think I've sprinted in two years because I just <laughs> put fleets on and they're kind of loose. And I was like. Uh, yeah, I don't think I've like gotten out of the saddle. <laughs> he was like, really? And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah. I've just stopped pedaling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but hey, you know, everyone has, you know, just get out on a bike. It's fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then so getting back to the type one diabetes, do you think that's sort of what I mean, kept you in like competitive cycling? Or is it, has that always pushed you to exercise and lead like the super healthy lifestyle or? Uh, so the, I didn't get diagnosed until I was 25, I believe. Okay. So I actually like my entire collegiate athlete, you know, career was as a, I probably like shouldn't say like, but as like a normal, not ill human. Okay. So you were <laughs> crazy before that then. <laughs> yeah. I was kind of like raised really healthy and, um, like, I didn't know that people ate full bowls of Fruit Loops. I thought, like, in my our household, you were allowed to take a small handful and sprinkle them on top of your, like, shredded wheat rice puff things. <laughs> I, 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 did, I had no idea until I got to college that people actually ate Pop-Tarts and, yeah. So I was right. always pretty, pretty healthy. So getting type 1 diabetes when I was 25 was shocking. Yeah. Because I think um, I had, it was like that awkward time out of college. And crew is a weight-based sport. Mm-hmm. So you have to be under 130. So you're very conscious of your eating. And um, it was like just enough after college that you kind of are getting lazy. You're learning how to like exist as a working adult-ish. Mm-hmm. And I knew the f- easiest way for me to lose weight from crew was to cut out all refined sugar. So when I got diagnosed with diabetes, I don't think I touched refined sugar for like eight months. So oh. when they said you have diabetes, I was like, you no, you don't understand what? Because I am like, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. I got taught about type one, and I was like, what? <laughs> that doesn't seem fair at all. Yeah. So now I'm an insulin dependent diabetic. Okay, so. so um, you're in Boulder now from New York. I feel like this is just. I mean, you just listed like yeah, eight just places you've lived, but like Boulder. How did how did you end up there? Uh, so I work in advertising, and there's a pretty awesome advertising agency out here called Crispin, Porter, and Bogusky. Mm-hmm. So uh, they, I was working at RGA in New York City, and they came calling. I was kind of at the point, um, you know, just in my life where I wanted a change of jobs, mm-hmm. and they're a really great agency. Uh, I came out, loved it, said, well, that wouldn't be bad. It's kind of sick of New York. I think I came home from work one day, and my roof rack of my from on my car was stolen. What? I think I had like a breakdown on the side of the street in Williamsburg. I just kind of like fell to the ground screaming because <laughs> they also bent my door frames and I was just like, I'm done with New York. I'm done. And then the next day, an agency in San Francisco and 
the one in Boulder called and I was like, yeah, screw this. I'm taking one of these jobs. I'm out of here. I'm done with New York. That's very like the universe has your back. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So they moved me out here and now I'm like stuck here until someone wants to move me somewhere else. I'm pretty sure. (laughs) I mean, you could be stuck in a lot worse places. (laughs) Yeah. It's not bad. Yeah. So I left, I left that job a little under a year and just became full-time freelance creative director Mm-hmm. And that's working out. And the kombucha thing kind of happened in a slow month. I got, I'm not really good when I'm not busy. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that it was an accident. So let's, let's dive into that. <laughs> uh, so I was, I was freelancing at an ad agency and we would go get coffee every day. And the coffee was really strong and we were there for like a longer day and I couldn't drink another cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. They had a whole case of kombucha. And Boulder's very kombucha heavy. We love kombucha here. And I was like, oh, I'll just have that instead because I won't be as jittery. And I'm like looking at the ingredients and I remember seeing that this kombucha had love actually listed in the ingredients, like underneath the nutrition (laughs) label. And I just like looked at my creative director partner that I was working with and I was like, this is so stupid. Like this is a slightly alcoholic because it has under 1% alcohol, Mm -hmm. you know, caffeinated because it's made from a green black or white tea beverage and they're all these are these are crazy they're marketing them all as this like hippie relaxing like thing this is basically (laughs) a red bull this is crazy and i was and then i just started going off on how i was going to make an aggressive kombucha and then we were thinking of names and i was i'm going to call it mortal kombucha finish it and i'm going to have like a commercial where people are like blowing kombucha at each other's heads and they're you know And we were just laughing. And then I was coming up with like aggressive punny names. And it didn't stop for like two weeks. Just every time we'd go to the coffee shop, like me joking about my fake kombucha brand. And then uh, (laughs) the project ended and I'm just kind of sitting at home, like still going on about my fake kombucha brand, especially in Boulder, which is just like such a caricature of itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was then I'm sitting there with my fiance. and I was like going on. He's like, why don't we just go make some kombucha? Cause, uh, and I was like, I don't know how to make it. He's like, we'll just, we'll go to the, the brewery place. Cause there's a brewing supply place here and we'll just ask them. And I was like, okay. So we drive down there and there's like this guy who probably spends his entire day just like drinking beer mm-hmm. or smoking weed. And I'm like, how do you make kombucha? And he just like loads me up with some books and some jars and stuff. And we go home and, uh, make the kombucha and read the book. And it was very fascinating. <laughs> I didn't know all the things about it. And then, you know, like a, two weeks later, we have kombucha and I flavor it with his instructions and with some reading. And then I was like, well, what do I do with it now? Like, and being in advertising, I'm like, I can't just like pour this into somebody else's bottle. Mm-hmm. I need my bottle. Of course. So I go back to the brewing store, I get a bottle and I'm like, I can't just walk around with this random bottle. I need a label. So <laughs> I, I, uh, I was, um, I used to, I was part of the people that started the feed.com. Right. So I kind of had all the credits with the sticker place in town from doing all their stuff. So I, uh, I like called the sticker place. I'm like, Hey, can you guys make me like 10 labels? And they're like, no, you need 200. And I was like, Oh my God. Okay. So I make a label and a logo real quick. And I'm like, whatever, 200. It's still fun. I'll just give, I'll just figure it out. <laughs> And then I find out, like, I get a really big discount on bottles if I buy, like, way more. So I'm like, whatever. This is just funny now. And I do that. And then I was like, I wonder if people will buy this. So I make a fake website or a real website. And um, that's how it started. And then all of a sudden sales started coming in. And I was like, oh, my God. I think I just started a company. That is amazing. So we actually so we, like <laughs> rushed into like, let's get lots of stuff taken. We need, I need to like figure out what you need to do to actually have a food company. And yeah. that like a, oh my God, mind blowing headache. And then I had these great guys that I hired to help me get all my ducks in a row. So that's, yeah. that's hilarious. <laughs> so we're up North of Toronto right now. And oh. a few months ago we were like, we're going to try brewing kombucha because <laughs> I was honestly the amount of money that I spend on kombucha in a week. Yeah, it's expensive. That's like was another reason yeah. that we were like, do this because I have time. And I was like four bucks, you know, five bucks mm-hmm. a time. 
why why is this so expensive and i realize now it's it takes a lot of time yeah and i mean it's amazing and it's it's you know like i admit like my brewing it was pretty like crappy compared to you know drinking like a, a brand that actually knows what they're doing because i am yeah. like the laziest kombucha brewer ever but and as you get bigger it actually gets easier because you're not leaving as many things to chance and your equipment is yeah. better um because yeah like doing it in a little jar like one gallon at a time that's with what some, we were like, doing yeah. pads, very variable things can happen because you are like de- dealing with live cultures and the whole like symbiotic balance of things but as you get bigger it's all controlled it's more like it's very controlled yeah so yeah. that makes sense i mean it's like brewing i guess beer in your house versus brewing it like in you know a small microbrewery type setting yeah exactly it's like yeah which is was also i was like oh we'll just make more and it was like oh this isn't like making more crystal light where you just put more powder in water <laughs> it's like a completely different process when you have to go to more so That's for someone who's like yeah i work in advertising so i mean it makes I, sense it's an eye opener. <laughs> i think like, it's so funny though how easy it was for you to get the stuff to make it so in collingwood where we were we had to like go online and like find like a friend of a friend of a friend who knew somebody to get your and, little scoby oh my god we had to like go like knock on a back door like three times like they come to the door we hand them 20 bucks they hand us a mason jar we like run away <laughs> So I learned the other day that the prose closet started before it was the prose closet as selling scobies on the internet. What? I don't know if if Pete was lying to me, but like, I was like, what? He's like, yeah, it was, uh, first it was selling scobies. But uh, yeah, we made our scobies. So that was, that was kind of interesting too. Oh, that's so cool. (laughs) Okay. So if somebody's brewing their own kombucha, I mean, obviously they should be trying more little kombucha because it seems amazing and I am like beyond excited to try it now that I realize that you have it um but if somebody's trying to brew it do you have any tips for like a first time brewer um I would say don't short on the sugar Mm -hmm. in the tea part of it and let it sit longer than you think Mm -hmm. and yeah yeah I think that's it's patience. It's like a lot of patience. Mm-hmm. And try not if you're gonna flavor it. Um, don't do a super like sugary flavor, like or a sugary fruit. We tried to do mango in the very beginning, and mango speeds up the fermentation process, so it can get vinegary very fast. Okay. If you're the more sugary your flavor is. Okay. So. And so let's let's back up for anyone who doesn't know about the <laughs> awesomeness of kombucha, because again, uh, I am beyond addicted. But what makes it like such a sick drink? So it's a fermented drink. So it's basically it's sweet tea fermented, and when you ferment anything, it makes nutrients more bioavailable, or it makes like a toxic food nutritious, more or less. Mm-hmm. And it um. It has a lot of really good bacteria in it, and it kind of promotes gut health. And I don't, I don't know. It makes my stomach feel really good. That's all I know. But Ugh, mine too. it has all the things of like they say. Like it can't. It's not like it cures. Like a, people are like, oh, it helps my diabetes. It's not going to cure diabetes. It's not going to cure cancer. It's not going to cure anything you have. But the point of a fermented food is kind of to put your body back in balance Mm -hmm. so that you can function efficiently and that your body can be at its best to take care of itself. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Like, so while it's not going to like help you see better, it'll put your body in a less stressed state because like exercise stresses your body, good things stress your body and bad things stress your body. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of returns you to efficient, you know, functions. Yeah. I think the other good thing for me was it made me stop drinking as much because I actually swapped out like drinking wine at night for drinking kombucha <laughs> like every other night. Yeah, that's what because like people who like bubbles or like a flavored thing, it yeah. definitely can replace alcohol, carbonated beverages, beer, soda. I mean, there are some kombuchas that I would say that some people have like brewed kombucha beers and they taste like a saison or like a sour ale. and They're oh. really good. But um, I, I do not do that because mm-hmm. I need a whole new set of licenses to do oh, that. Oh, God, yeah. I have to do the first set, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, yeah. so you're still copywriting, though, too. And I, I know you're still writing for other places and all of that. How are you balancing that? <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, you divide your day as, well, like Oprah does a lot in her day, right? So it's basically, true. I'm trying to be like Oprah. You're pretty um, much Oprah. That's yeah, true. I'm Oprah of, uh, of fermentation. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> it's a... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. It's like a lot of waking up early. I was, um, actually I had, I was off my bike from about November of last year until just a few weeks ago. So that was pretty convenient. Oh, no so wonder you awesome. started a business. You have all this yeah, extra energy. Of, yeah. So like being off your bike and then, yeah, having nervous energy of just too, too much basically made this possible. But now trying to figure out like the weather's nice and like yeah I want to go ride my bike oh yeah I also have to pour big vinegary sugary water from one pile to another and then bottle it and then ship it and then do my job that pays me it's hard yeah (laughs) but you know you, you just do it there's a lot of hours in the day if you don't sleep I, yeah, I have heard that. <laughs> no, I, but yeah, I was also actually trying to race is helpful also. Like if I was trying to race this year, yeah, it would be possible. But this is it's a really fun too because working in advertising, you're always making other brands, you know, growing them, and it's mm-hmm. been really fun to do it for myself because every bottle is like a little mini billboard and mm-hmm. no not the client so I get to tell myself no or yes <laughs> it's fun. I love that I was actually thinking about this yesterday because I like you know skipped out for a run and I had like a billion other things to do and I came back and I was like you know what even if I hadn't gone on that run I wouldn't get any more done like sometimes you just need to have the workout in the day even if it like feels like you shouldn't be like skipping out Oh, it's totally helpful. Yeah. It's energizing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, like I would have just taken that hour and like sat and like read a novel or something because my brain just can't function like at that level yeah. all day. I basically have like a lot of like if I could take a picture of my desk in my office, it's like a lot of post-it notes and lists of things that I haven't done yet. And I actually <laughs> just write on the top of my like list, I go things to do tomorrow, but it's so it's always tomorrow you know? Yep. So it's never to do today because that's stressful. I like that. I like that a lot, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah. I use a, I use like Todoist, this like to-do listing app. And I feel like I spend most of my day just rescheduling things for other days. <laughs> See, I'm an analog. I can't do these digital lists. I just, because then I just don't open the app or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then I never see it. So I just put post-it notes everywhere. I'll be interested when I start living somewhere, which hopefully will happen by this time next year. Yeah. How how different that's going to be. Because right now I like love notebooks. I'm addicted to office supplies, but I can't carry Mm -hmm. them. Like (laughs) I I can't bring a desk with me everywhere. So what is it about? Like, cause you're a writer. I'm a writer. I, I hoard pens. Like anytime I go to a meeting at an office, I'll be like, oh, this is a good pen. It's like I've never seen a pen before. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, they're giving out a pad. And then I come home and I'm like, what the hell? Like, where am I going to put these things? Oh, yeah. No, at, at like where I have all my stuff, I literally have a box of blank notebooks. That has not stopped me from buying new notebooks like on a weekly basis. But... Yeah, like when you go to Target and there's like a really pretty one. Right? I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my. And it's graph paper in the inside. Oh, I mm-hmm. love it. Yeah. What are you supposed to do, really? Yeah. I mean, I blame Target for most things, but... Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. So in addition to all of the other stuff you do, you have... I mean, Bicycling just did an article on you and Mortal Kombucha, which was awesome. And the photos for that were amazing, by the way. Oh, yeah. I I sent the photographer, this uh, Morgan Levy, I sent her like, oh my God, you made me look so pretty. (laughs) I mean, you're gorgeous, but, like, the photos are just so yeah. good. I, like, you know, I scroll through all of my various feeds, and, you know, normally not a lot, not a lot stops me, and I, like, immediately stopped on that. I was like, oh, she's doing such cool stuff. Oh. <laughs> you know, I just try to really keep a presence of cool on my social media, but in totally. real life, it's just, like, crying in naps, so. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that. 
<laughs> but you also write for bicycling too. And one of the pieces I like spotted the other day um, while I was, you know, social media stalking you to get ready to talk to you, as one does, um, yeah. was the how to handle getting dropped piece, oh. <laughs> which I <laughs> love. Pro- so first of all, did you did you pitch that idea or did you get thrown that idea? Oh, for that one, I think I pitched that idea. <laughs> was it like yeah. a personal thing or had you just dropped somebody? Had you been dropped? <laughs> Uh, oh, I'm dropped from, like I said, I don't think I've finished with the rest of, I always say, like, I finished the race first. Like, I was done racing before anybody else. Because mm-hmm. I just, I'm like, I'm this stupid. I'm out of this. Everyone's riding too hard. But, um. Okay, by the way, the worst part of a cyclocross race is when you're, like, way off the back, and it's, like, the last lap, and they wave you through, and you're like, Oh, my Seriously? God. Oh, I don't. I will break. I will break. I'll be like, I don't need to do another lap. I know no. where I am. I'm going to go through this so slowly that by the time I get to the finishing straight. Like, it's not 80%. Are you kidding me? Um, no, I think I pitched that to them. And it was actually funny because they wanted a range of people to tell the stories of getting dropped. And they wanted a pro. And it, I had to reach out to a bunch of guys. And I think it was House that... Uh, finally came around and said yeah he would tell a drop story oh my god getting a guy to admit that he's ever been dropped for any- you know and, and like yeah so even his was like you know he had to, it was like it was pretty funny and I think it involved like a van and like I, I don't even remember I remember it was crazy when he was telling it to me um <laughs> linearly I was like taking notes and I'm like I don't even know how to make this make sense but uh <laughs> yeah it was funny getting people to be like yeah I can't wait to be in a magazine about being slow and dropped off the back <laughs> <laughs> oh nationwide awesome Perfect. you know but yeah somehow it worked out so what was some like what were some of the best takeaways when you wrote that piece no one no one likes getting dropped but everyone <laughs> ha- you basically it's a lot of internal justification you know yes I swear me, cycling has made me yeah. rationalize everything so much better. Like I am amazing at rationalizing. <laughs> you become psychotic. That's what happened. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was really great to hear people's stories though. Cause like my own one is like, you know, whether it's dropped on like a ride, like now I'm joking around since I'm not riding as much that I want to get a bike, like a road bike with a motor just so I can like hang out with my friends on the weekend. Oh my God. I've said the same exact thing. I want the road bike. I want, I want the one though that like Femke had at worlds that like you can't tell. And I I don't want an e-bike. I want a road bike with a motor. Yep. And I want to stash the motor somewhere like 20 minutes up a climb and then Mm -hmm. put it on. Cause I don't want to ride with a, that it's heavy. Yeah. So that's my problem. But yeah, I was just like, I just want to, I'm not going to use it the whole time. I just want to use it so that I don't have to stop like two switchbacks before I get to the top to catch my breath because once I get to you guys, you keep riding like I was riding slow for my health or something, oh which God. I never that understood. Is, that is, by the way, the best piece of advice that I think I have ever heard. Just like stop a couple <laughs> switchbacks down and like get ready to like have them just take off. Because I get there and they're like, oh, we've been waiting. And I'm like, well, I'm I- dying. <gasps> so. <laughs> yeah, I do that when I go skate skiing. Also, I stop like 20 feet before the group. That's so good. So I can catch my breath because I'm like the only thing that I'm I'm really bad at like basketball pool climbing hills on my bike and skate skiing. I'm the worst at skate skiing. I am the worst at cross country skiing. So I feel you. Yeah, I've never even tried regular cross country. Oh, so. it's dumb. It's it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. So yeah, I just stop. I'm like, no, you guys go. I'll be alone. I don't need this, mm-hmm. this pressure. But if you That's can just my turn on that dr- motor and just get like that extra like 80 watts. Yeah, especially like there'll be times like I'll roll, like in Boulder, you're surrounded by really fast people and people who do this and get paid to do it. Mm-hmm. And you know, you'll meet at a coffee shop and you'll start rolling out up a mountain, not mm-hmm. a hill, a mountain that's like going to be, could be two hours. And I'm huffing and puffing. And they're conversationally talking and asking me questions that require more than a, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and then they'll stop and, like, a guy will, like, go to the bathroom and still catch back on. And I'm just, like, holding on to the back of, like, this group that's chatting and laughing in more than four-word sentences. And I just, like, at one point, some point, just, I'm like, I got to turn off. I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> this makes no sense. <laughs> you guys get paid to do this. I get paid to do other things. Bye. Yep. <laughs> 
Oh, man. Yeah, like, I feel like the most effort I've ever put in during a ride hasn't been in a race. It's been, like, in a group ride like that where I'm trying to, like, look super cool and, like, make casual <laughs> conversation. And, you know, when you're doing the responding, even though your heart rate's, like, 180 and you can't you really breathe and you're wasting Yeah, what do you think of- about that? <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> I have, like, faked oh. a sneeze just to, like, get in, like, a deep breath. Like, it's so I don't know bad. if you know Ariel from – he used to live in New York. He lives out in the Bay Area now. He used to, like, practice five-minute intervals with talking so that he could, like, mentally, you know, mess with people. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. I sometimes try to sing, and then I'll, like, untake a, I take a headphone – your butt mm-hmm. out and I'll realize I don't sound as good as I thought. No. But that's really all I try to do. <laughs> Cause it's amazing that. like that, like Britney Spears could like dance really hard mm-hmm. and sing at the time. So I try to do it on my bike and I can't. Not not as successfully as Britney. I mean, who no. can be, but again, she's a pro. I'm not yeah, a pro. It's true. <laughs> But yeah, I keep saying I want the motor because we we coach like junior training camps and stuff and you know, 17 year old (laughs) boys, right? Like, yeah, going up a mountain with them, like they're all racing each other and like being super cool. How awesome would it be to just like start the motor like they don't know it's in there? Just be like, hey, guys, like, I'm just gonna go hard for a second. Like, don't don't try to keep up. It's fine. And then just take off. I think it's great. And like, I, I was trying to tell a group of people like earlier this week that I would not use it to drop people. I would only use it to keep up. Oh, I would use it to drop. And I would not you would use it to drop. Like, no <laughs> well, question. Different. Totally different. That's teaching them a lesson about like humility and, you know, that girls Until your can your motor ride. goes out and yeah. you just start to go <laughs> Guys, can you push me up this next hill? My bike's really heavy. <laughs> exactly. That's why you have to... With the motor comes a lot of responsibility to only mm-hmm. use it in key situations. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so other than cycling, have you been into any other fitness stuff, especially when you were off the bike? Yeah, during my off the bike, um, I started going to CrossFit a bunch. Ooh. That was fun. Um, since I did do crew in college, crew is basically CrossFit. Um <laughs> Which is what, what I learned from CrossFit was like, oh, it's just like Olympic lifting and box jumps and ridiculous things that make you want to puke. I did this for four years in mm-hmm. college or three and a half. But um, yeah, uh, and then I also did uh, this Pilates place I go to started having actually like ergs in there. So I actually started going to rowing class and I realized that cycling made me a way better rower than I was in college. What? That was fun. Yeah, my splits were like, unless they weren't calibrated, but they were brand new machines, um, were like better than it was when I, I was racing like in a boat that was number one in the country. So that's pretty cool. That's rad. Or I have old lady strength now, maybe. Mm-hmm. So that's cool too. Um, but yeah, so I, I got like really muscly. And uh, <laughs> now, I'm trying to, now I'm trying to get back in bike shape. Because it sucks not being able to hang out with your friends when it's nice outside. So... And yeah, everyone here's way enough. too fast, so. Mm-hmm. And then, okay, so I was totally Twitter stalking, and I saw that you linked to a post about uh, yin yoga. Have you tried that? Okay, so my Twitter, I downloaded this thing, and I can't stop it because I can't remember what it's called. There's a lot of cat stuff also. Yeah, I have a bot that tweets for me, and I when I installed it, I picked categories of cat gifts, dog gifts, and yoga or maybe oh my God, like no wonder I love your Twitter so much and yoga <laughs> and so it just populates it and that's... then I click on it too because I'm like oh that was a good tweet Becca oh my god that's amazing <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to find out like remember what it was called so that I can stop it because sometimes people text me and they're like you're you've gotten really basic and I'm like I don't know it's kind of <laughs> So basic. I mean, you're brewing so, yeah, kombucha. I'm, you're like, <laughs> I'm going to CrossFit. Going I have a CrossFit. bot that runs my Twitter. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Boulders made you change, Becca. Yeah, I I think the bot does some really good things, and mm-hmm. I think it's real humans that write the tweets, and then it pushes them. I'm really not sure. If I find it, I'll let you like put that in the notes, like that everyone can have their own. Yeah, I'm like shit, automated I want this. Twitter account. 
but I do like tweet some some of the things. But <laughs> anything about yoga, cat gifts, or coffee, probably not me. Oh my god, that's amazing! Because like. <laughs> I was like, this seems really kind of weird when I looked through it, but like, it definitely didn't occur to me that it wasn't like you. I was like, huh? Yeah, she really I likes know. cats. <laughs> like, I don't even have a pet. I'm like not even a pet person. Yeah, what? like yeah, I guess like five hours ago, which would be when I was, I guess I I was riding. No, I was sleeping. Um, it says, "What the heck is nitro coffee?" But I know what nitro coffee is. Yeah, and but nitro I coffee is I tweeted amazing. that. <laughs> Yeah, yin yoga, a practice every athlete should adopt. Yeah, yeah, that does sound something great. I should read that. Yeah, it was actually a really good article. I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> oh, yeah, then I have, like, a dog, like, waving out a window. Yeah, I need to know Twitter. <laughs> Why do cats purr? The reason will surprise you. So good. It's a really good Twitter. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, I, so I just saw the, the yin yoga thing, and I was like, so I just took this, like, crazy ass yoga class like kundalini yoga that was like all meditation with yoga so oh. now everyone i'm just like talk to me about yoga so i i do do yoga mm-hmm. i but i do uh i go to core power like the starbucks of yoga i call it oh my god but it's you in are med- basic. Any city. <laughs> so when i'm traveling i can like go to yoga because it's like the same studio same class like i know it's not going to be this life transforming experience mm-hmm. but i know what i'm going to get Mm-hmm. which is like Starbucks. It's good coffee. It's fine. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I do do that. But I do have a thing with one of my teammates, Anna Grace, and we're going to try to be able to do handstands this year. Ooh. I mean, that does make I want to be able to lift the... my legs up, you know, like when they look like gravities. Yeah. You know, I, just, I, I can't do it. I don't understand what happens. No, it's really weird. I'm, I've, I've been trying to do that kind of on and off for a couple of years and I still have no concept of how that works. It's nuts. Like I'll be in this class. It's hot yoga. There's a, all these women. And then all of a sudden everyone's legs start floating up. <laughs> I just feel completely inadequate. You're like, did I not get the anti-gravity device that they all yeah, got? Is everyone's legs floating up and I'm just stuck in like, you know, horse pose or something. Everyone else is putting their <laughs> legs up. But I, I think um, Erica Lark do handstands, I'm pretty sure. The, the uh, Actually, the We Got to Hang Out podcast girls at Sea Otter had a bunch of people doing hand or cartwheels and handstand type things. And mm. that was a pretty, like, humbling experience. I tried to do one and my hips hurt for, like, a week cartwheel yeah I tried to like play it off really cool afterwards yeah that was yeah no problem like that was super easy I was yeah. dying I, like, I had to like limp home so you didn't go for the round off like the running round off after your cartwheel that was pretty much like my cartwheel is a round off to be totally oh, okay. honest it You're... was not pretty <laughs> it was energetic I'll give myself that did you like stop and like wave your hands up in the air and do like the spirit fingers and point your fingertips out like a real gymnast. I did more like the gymnast, yeah, like the really pro gymnast, you know, like chest out, like arms up at the end. I'm doing right. it right now at my desk, despite the fact that you can't see me. <laughs> Good. It was really emphatic. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I think the last thing I want to talk about is, I mean, for young people, any people really getting into bike racing, Mm. you've you've had fun with it you've been doing it for you know a decade now and still seem to like doing it so what are some tips for getting started for people that are just kind of nervous about getting into the competitive side of it um I think you should go in with realistic expectations whatever those are I think that a lot of people go in maybe they come from another sport or um I I don't know some people go in with like really high unrealistic expectations, which anytime expectations in reality don't meet, you get disappointment. Mm -hmm. So if you can monitor your expectations and make realistic goals, I think that's super, super helpful. I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people get too caught up trying to move up the category system rather than learning um, tactics and techniques and bike handling where they are Mm -hmm. at each point. I think, um, like, I, I wish that I stayed down longer I think it's a it's one skill set to get you know fifth sixth seventh place it's another to or even second Mm -hmm. it's a completely different skill set to win and do that consistently 
And you should learn how to do that as a four. You should learn how to do that as a three Mm -hmm. and be able to do it before you move yourself up. Because as you get up, like the talent pool gets a lot, you know, and women, unfortunately, like there's not that many really, really, really fast women. So if you're not, it's just a huge discrepancy when you get to like the pro one, two race and you're like, oh man, I was crushing it as those three cat three races I did. And then you're never going to see the front of a race again. And you're never going to learn the techniques you need to see the front of the race because you might be strong enough, but it's a different game. I think it's like a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you said that. (laughs) (laughs) That's yeah. that's one thing we always tell, you know, some of the younger athletes that, like, mm-hmm. don't want to maybe do a local race or, like, you know, they're like, oh, like, it's going to be way too easy or, like, they kind of do this weird self-handicapping thing of, like, I'm going to ride to the race or, like, yeah, do all these weird things and we're like, no, like, take wins when you can get them because you're not yeah. going to get them all the time when you upgrade. Yeah, and, like, you know, take the opportunities if you think that the race is beneath you or whatever it is or you're too strong, then, like, learn how to win differently. Like, Mm -hmm. ride a break, ride solo, you know, win out of a sprint. Like, use the race to teach yourself different scenarios because when you – when everyone is as good as you or better, you're not going to be able to control what happens. Like, I joke now that, like, I just participate – like, I get raced. I don't race. Like, I don't even know what's (laughs) happening. I'm like, you know, 50 wheels back. I don't like there was a break. I had no idea. You know, like I just know we were going fast and then we sat up and it eased up and we were going fast again. You know, so being able to, you know, learn how to deal with different situations is super important. And I think, you know, people it's competitive. So there's like a there's an honor of being like, oh, I'm a cat three. I'm a cat two. I'm a cat one and moving up. But you should be patient. Yes. While you're doing it. No, I think that's... And just go out and try. Like, yeah. <laughs> for girls just starting, cyclocross is great, I think, because that was the thing from the dropped article. Like, I think when you're dropped in cyclocross, it's way less obvious and it's more fun. Being dropped in a road race sucks. You're just dropped, like, very obviously. You know, everyone cheers and then you ride through, like, two minutes later. Mm-hmm. It's... Um, but no one... Everyone's super self-conscious and no one's going to care yeah but just just uh after the race you know don't be like oh yeah i was in the chase group like you were dropped that's also annoying (laughs) you were not in the chase group (laughs) yeah you can't be in the chase group if you're chasing the race yeah (laughs) (laughs) but yeah i think it's just really a lot of patience and don't be scared ask for help you know ride your bike i think until you get to a point where you're trying to be competitive in the race the best way to improve is just ride your bike more Mm -hmm. and ride it with people. I think that's super important. Yeah. So many people I know do all of their training solo. And I admit like I'm probably one of those people because I really prefer riding solo, but then you get in a race and you're just like, Oh my God, I haven't done this in like years. Yeah. I mean, like if you're trying to do crits and stuff, like read a book about what, what lines are like, it's the same in race car driving, like learn what an apex is and how to take a turn and ask people who do it, like how to break into one. And cause these are things that you don't really learn unless you have a coach that shares those things with you, or you talk to racers that, you know, are racing at a higher level, but there's a lot of skills that, um, people don't have, mm-hmm. which is it, that creates all the crashes basically. Yes. Absolutely. People are people are playing dif- riding different races within a race and um learn learn the skills there are skills to to it like you can't just go play basketball and just like chuck the ball around there's like technique. Yeah. So I wish there was more coaches. I think um Allison Powers does a great job at teaching her clients how to race and ride like those are two separate things. Yeah. Learning how to race in your drops I think is a lot of you know, you don't just ride around in your drops all the time. It, then all of a sudden you're in a race and knowing if you can grab your brakes. Yes. You know, it's, they feel different like when you try to modulate them and stuff. So I think uh, there's a lot of things people don't think about that until it's too late and you're in the race and then you're too tired to 
think anymore. That's funny. I I didn't even think about that, but you're so right. Like the only time I ever really like rode in the drops was yeah, like in some kind of like race kind of scenario, whether it was like a hard group ride or an actual race. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like I never do that when I'm solo. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, just like, yeah. I'm sure I've done a lot of jackassy things in races because (laughs) of it. (laughs) <laughs> you know, you're like a whole you're in a whole kind of different position on your bike so just mm-hmm. turning is different because you're weighting your body differently and yeah no oh, absolutely but your inside leg up when you go around to turn if you can or yeah. know where your pedals are if they're gonna strike i don't know things yeah. people don't really think about but they should in yes. the very beginning because make it a habit i think that's the point mm-hmm. no i love that all right last thing where can people find you and mortal kombucha they can find me in Boulder. No, um, Mortal just Kombucha stalk right you now. in Boulder. It's fine. Yeah, it's cool. Um, Mortal Kombucha right now is available most uh, in Boulder. You can just find me, like literally stalk me or message me, and I can get it to you. I'm working. I'm trying to get this guy Josh Crane, who owns the Coffee Ride, to deliver it. <laughs> but uh, oh, I think bottles, I interviewed like, him once. <laughs> yeah, he's great. So. We're, we're, uh, I'm, I'm making him my business partner No, but, uh, <laughs> he's great. Also order your coffee from him if you're in the Boulder area, but, um, otherwise online at mortalkombucha.com. We should have a subscription service <gasps> coming up, but, uh, it's just, uh, rolling that out development wise. So if you were interested in that, you can sign up for our newsletter, which is at the bottom and then you'll be kept up to date. Otherwise, you can just order it right on there. And we ship within like a week or so because I only ship on Monday or Tuesdays because I do have to be kept cold the entire time because it mm-hmm. is a living drink. So coldness keeps the bacteria and yeast from continuing fermentation. Mm-hmm. So Monday and Tuesday, make sure that people get it within like two to three days while the ice packs are still cold. So get it. Don't let it like sit out on your front porch. Put it in the fridge. Yeah. But you can oh, sit out. Like that. if you're going out for the day, people are like, can I carry it around with me during the day? And I'm like, yeah, it's a drink. Like you can keep yogurt out. But yeah, just, <laughs> like, just put it in the fridge and it tastes better cold. But. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. man, I love it. I'm signing up for the newsletter right now because I love this subscription service thing. You need to start shipping to Canada, though, since that's where I think we're going to be after uh, this year. Yeah. So. And I worked at the feed, we would have some like athletes and stuff in Canada. And uh, if a cliff bar can't make it to Canada, like I don't no, know. Shipping if, up here is uh, kind of a nightmare. It's awful. Like I sure would not blame you. She's not going to make it. <laughs> no, I'll just, you know what? We'll, we'll talk. I'll just, I'll start brewing kombucha up here. We'll be like the Canadian distributors. Perfect. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, it was so good catching up. This was super fun. I love when I get to do episodes with people from my my New Jersey bike racing days. (laughs) Yeah. And if you're ever in Boulder. That's the hope. One One of these days soon. Thanks so much for listening to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. We would love if you would head over to iTunes and leave us a review. And while you're there, consider subscribing. We'd also love to connect over at Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Molly J. Herford and Peter is at Peter Glassford. If you have ideas or questions from today's podcast, or you just want to browse some of the show notes and past shows, you can also check us out at consummateathlete.com. Thanks, guys, and we will see you next time.